those kind of things upgrade your confidence. They upgrade your commitment to your goals and they expand your views of what's possible. So I watched her go through that. And then I watched the, the trickle effect of how over time her business really started to explode. Hey, podcast family, and welcome to episode number 281 of the L3 Leadership Podcast, where we are obsessed with helping you grow to your maximum potential and to maximize the impact of your leadership. My name is Doug Smith, and I am your host, and today's episode is brought to you by my friends at Bear Tongue Advisors. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. And every month we're committed to bringing you at least two episodes, one of which will be a conversation with a high-level leader that I have, and the other will be a personal leadership lesson by me that I know will add value to your life. So I hope that you'll become a subscriber. And uh, thank you in advance for that. And for those who have been listening to the L3 Leadership Podcast for a while, thank you so much. You mean the world to me. And uh, just make sure that you're subscribed. And if you would leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or whatever app you listen to podcasts through, that would mean the world to me. It really does help us grow our audience and reach more leaders. So thank you in advance for that. Well, in today's episode, you'll hear my conversation with Benjamin Hardy, and let me just tell you a little bit about him for those who aren't familiar. He's an organizational psychologist and the author of the book, Willpower Doesn't Work and Personality Isn't Permanent. He's also co-authored the book, Who Not How with Dan Sullivan, who I love, which has sold over 120,000 copies in the first four months of publication. And he's currently working on a second book with Dan called The Gap and the Gain, which will be published in October of 2021. And I can't wait to get my hands on that. Benjamin's blogs have been read by over 100 million people and featured on the Harvard Business Review, the New York Times, Forbes, Fortune, CNBC, and many others. And for several years, he was the number one most read author on Medium.com. He and his wife adopted three kids from the foster care system, which we love, and we actually talk a little bit about that in our conversation. And listen to this, a month after that adoption, his wife became pregnant with twins who were also born in 2018, and then in 2020, they had their sixth child, Rex. So needless to say, Benjamin is a busy guy. And uh, you're going to love this conversation, especially if you're a content producer. We talk a lot about writing and just the habits that you need uh, to get content out, and you're going to love this. But before we get into the conversation, just a few announcements. This episode of the L3 Leadership Podcast is sponsored by Bear Tongue Advisors. The financial advisors at Bear Tongue Advisors help educate and empower clients to make informed financial decisions. You can find out how Bear Tongue Advisors can help you develop a customized financial plan for your financial future by visiting their website at BearTongueAdvisors.com. That's B E R A T U N G Advisors.com. Securities and investment products and services offered through Waddell and Reed Inc., member FINRA and SIPC. Bear Tongue Advisors, Waddell and Reed, and L3 Leadership are separate entities. I also want to thank our sponsor, Henny Jewelers. They're a jeweler owned by my friend and mentor, John Henny. And my wife, Laura, and I got our engagement and wedding rings through Henny Jewelers, and we just loved our experience. But not only do they have great jewelry, they also love and invest in and believe in people. In fact, every couple that gets engaged and comes to their store, they give them a book to help them prepare for their marriage, and we just love that. So if you're in need of a good jeweler, check out hennyjewelers.com. And with all that being said, let's dive right into the episode. Here's my conversation with Benjamin Hardy. So thank you, Benjamin, for being willing to do this interview. And why don't we just start off with you telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Yeah. So live here in Orlando, Florida. I've got, I'm married. I have six kids. We adopted three of those kids from the foster system, have three others. So six kids is quite a bit, uh, pretty intense. We're done having kids, which is awesome. But <laughs> yeah, I'm an organizational psychologist. So I got my PhD in organizational psychology at Clemson University. Uh, if you follow college football, I yeah. was there for Deshaun Watson national championship and Trevor Lawrence national championship. So that was pretty, pretty fun. Yeah. And I just write, I write, uh, let's just call it psychology, self-improvement and entrepreneurial, uh, related topics. I spent quite a bit of time writing at medium.com when it was a fresh, interesting platform and was able to grow a huge audience and platform there and then kind of transition that to writing mainstream books. And so I've written, a uh, couple books, Willpower Doesn't Work, Personality Isn't Permanent, more recently, Who Not How with Dan Sullivan, and uh, just continuing to write books and continuing to learn. Yeah, so I, I want to start with just talking about writing. Um, one, I'm just curious how you got started writing, and then you mentioned you started writing for Medium, and uh, I believe, were you the most popular Medium author for, for a significant amount of time? Years. I, 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 yeah, for years, which is, <laughs> is not easy to do. So tell us a little bit about how you got started writing, and then I want to dive into the art of writing. 
Absolutely. Love it. Uh, it was actually when I was living in Pittsburgh. I know you guys are from Pittsburgh and uh, I was living there serving a church mission. And I really got into journaling at that time. I started reading a lot of spiritual stuff, religious stuff, personal development, business stuff. I just was, that's when I really started learning and reading a lot of books. And I just had a practice of journaling. I started just journaling about my own experiences of being a missionary. And then that kind of transitioned to more just journaling about thoughts, ideas, experiences. Uh, and it just led me to being in a flow state. Honestly, I just fell in love with just the art of just writing with my hand in a journal. It never, and uh, initially it wasn't writing so that I could eventually become a writer, but it did lead me to loving the art of writing. Uh, and then just through the process of reading lots of books while on that mission, I started to kind of build an identity for myself as someone who would want to write books in the future. I just loved it. I was having plenty of my own transformational experiences as a missionary. I was also having transformational experiences, just writing and learning how to write in a stream of consciousness way. And then just reading lots of very good books. It all just kind of collided together into this idea that I want to do writing and continue learning and writing moving forward. And so journaling is kind of the thing that ultimately led me there. Yeah, I'm a huge journaler. In fact, we try to get our whole L3 community journaling all the time. And so I'm just curious, talk to us about journaling. Do you still journal today? And what does your journaling practice look like? Yep, got my journal right here. Yes. I usually journal for about 10 to 20 minutes every day. Uh, usually I'll journal about things that I'm either dealing with right now, situations, people, opportunities, thoughts in my head. Uh, usually it floats mostly around towards what I'm trying to work on, what I'm like the goals I'm pursuing or just the situations I'm dealing with, or just thoughts I'm thinking about. It's just a, it's honestly, for me, it's like a private, uh, ther therapy session where I'm just thinking out loud and thinking to myself and thinking about my thinking and organizing my thinking. And it's just an amazing place to get clear, uh, clear mentally, clear emotionally, and also committed to whatever it is I'm trying to do. So it's just, it's journaling is just for me a very important place. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I, someone got me journaling in 2004 and I, it's a practice I swear by. So I love when I meet people who also are passionate about it. Now let's transfer from journaling to actually creating, a, you know, did you create a blog at first or did you just find medium and just say, Hey, I'm going to go hit publish somewhere and see what happens. What happened? Yeah. So 2014 was when my wife and I moved to Clemson, South Carolina. I started my PhD program in the fall of 2014. So like August and, um, it was from August forward when I really started to think like, okay, I'm serious about writing. I want to start. I, I got home from that Pittsburgh mission in 2010. And so from 2010 to 2014, I really didn't do anything. I just read a huge amount of books, got a bachelor's degree in psychology and knew I wanted to be a writer, but that did nothing about it. And so when we moved to Clemson, South Carolina in about in the fall of 2014, that's when I was like, okay, I really want to actually learn what it takes to be a writer. So I started studying Seth Godin, Michael Hyatt, Jeff Goins, like, all sorts of bloggers and writers that actually talk about how to actually start build a platform. I didn't initially want to be a blogger. I just wanted to start writing books. Mm -hmm. um, but as I further clarified what's involved in becoming an author, it became obvious that in order to become a traditionally published author, I needed to have some form of a platform or an audience. And so that's when it was like, okay, I need to actually start blogging and I need to build an audience. Before I came to that conclusion, though, I actually did write an ebook. The ebook was called Slipstream Time Hacking. It took me like a, a month to write. So I wrote that little ebook and I was trying to get a publisher. And then it, that's when it hit me in the face that, oh, you need to actually build a blog. So from there, it didn't take me long in early 2015 to find Medium. Uh, I built a website and I wrote a few blogs there. And I just realized there's no audience on my hmm. own website at the moment. And so I had heard from medium.com from someone and I just started copy pasting my articles onto medium.com. And it took about two to three months for one of them to go viral. And then from there, I just, just started writing on the platform and didn't really use my blog. I just wrote on medium and then sent people to my website to get onto my newsletter. Yeah. I'm curious what you would encourage people to do. Cause and again, I don't have much experience with medium, but my, my recollection is that the, the copy and paste thing, they don't like that. Cause it's not, content that's original because you're copying it from your blog. Is that true? And if someone's out there and maybe they have a blog, would you encourage them to stay in their own space on their own website? Or would you encourage them to do what you did and find a platform that they can publish on consistency? I'm going to ask you like 20 questions. So I'll just- That's cool. That. I love it. I would not recommend anyone write on Medium anymore. Unless, unless you're just looking for eyeballs, it's still a platform where you could potentially get page views, but they've overly regulated, overly controlled that platform to the degree mm -hmm. that you really can't put calls to action down at the bottom and send people, let's just say, to a landing page or to a website. They very much want to keep the 
audience on their platform rather than allowing writers to leverage their platform and bring an audience you know, into an email list or something like that. So Medium really went through a bunch of downhill processes from 2018 until now, which is why I've left that platform. It's just, they've overly controlled it. They're confused about the direction as a company and it's gone downhill a lot. Uh, I do think though, depending on what you're writing about, there are plenty of platforms, even something like a Facebook or an Instagram could be a great place to, you know, go to a place where there's an existing audience and then sending people to a website YouTube being a place for video content, LinkedIn, if you're doing more uh, motivational or business or things like that, LinkedIn, there's so many people that, you know, if you're consistent with a single platform, but using it to kind of build your own outside of that, if you're willing to invest in one platform for two, three years, LinkedIn could be an example of a place where you could develop a huge audience and then take them somewhere else. Yeah. So if you're me, would you just say, Doug, if you're going to write somewhere, just publish on LinkedIn every day. Don't worry about publishing on your own website. Just build an audience there. And then, you know, you can worry about the website or the book deal later. What would your advice be? Or do you just, hey, here's my post. I'm going to copy and paste it on every possible platform out there and, and see what happens. What I did for a long time, and I don't really blog anymore. I'm really kind of starting on YouTube. But um, what I did is, is I would publish on Medium and then I allowed syndication. So there would be Huffington Post. Like there'd be like 50 or more self-improvement blogs that would always grab my article and syndicate it. They would take it and copy paste it onto their own. And I would just say, yes, you can, anyone can take my article as long as they keep the call to action at the bottom. Cause the call to action at the bottom was what took people to my landing page, which offered people some free bonus, but ultimately it got people onto my email list. Um, and so what I would recommend to people is there's no problem putting the article on your own website, might as well put it there. And it's nice to get your own traffic. And maybe that's a goal that you can aspire towards now or in the future, but it's nice to leverage pre-existing platforms and pre-existing audiences. And so I would say in the case of LinkedIn, write at least 100 articles there. I think it's important to like commit to something for like enough output that you can actually get decent at it. So write at least hundred articles on LinkedIn as an experiment, create a call to action with a link to a landing page and give away something free. That's easy. You know, for me, for a long time, I gave away that free ebook, which was called slipstream time hacking. It was great. You know, I was getting like one to 2000 free one to 2000 emails a week, I mean a month, one to 2000 emails a month. But when I switched the call to action to something very easy, a seven page morning routine checklist, uh, it was a lot just simpler, easier, more action oriented. I went from 2000 opt-ins a month to 20,000. Wow. And I had, and I had 20,000 new emails a month for over two years with no paid traffic. It was just, I was just getting, you know, my medium blog got like 700,000 to a million views a month. And out of those 700,000 to a million views, I was getting about 20 to 30,000 emails a month for about two years. Um, so yeah, I would just say publish there, be willing to publish your stuff anywhere else, have a call to action, send people to a landing page. I'm happy to even show you the landing page that had over 800,000 people opt in, but ultimately feel free, you know, you can copy paste it anywhere else if you want to. Yeah. And then talk to me about what your advice would be on publishing versus pub self-publishing. You obviously learned that you needed a platform to actually become a published author, or at least with a publishing company. Yeah. What did you learn about that process? And what does it actually take to get interest from a publishing company? Is it a certain amount of email addresses? Is it a certain amount of followers? What has your experience been there? Yeah, uh, I think that it's definitely, it depends on your goal. You know, so every author has a goal. I know lots of entrepreneurs who their goal is not really to sell a million copies of a book. More their goal is to get the right 500 people to read their books that become high paying clients. And so you might not necessarily need a traditional publisher. Um, you could go and work with a self, you could self publish and work with a company like what Tucker Max, Tucker Max is a good friend of mine, but he's got a company called Scribe and they basically help you format interior, exterior, and help you have a professional looking book, but it's self-published, so you own the rights. So you can work with vendors or people who can help you make a very good looking book. So it looks real. It doesn't look like some junky self-published book, but it looks real, but you own the rights and you can then market it to your audience to get the right for people. If you're wanting, you know, I think a publisher makes sense for some people. For me, I like it. I'm not purely tied to it. I'm open to having some of my books in the future self-published. Um, but what I like about the publisher is, is that they're invested in the book doing well, you get an editor, you get the book in stores and stuff like that. And so for me, there's a lot of benefits to having a publisher. Uh, and I think that it makes my writing better. It's, it's a slower process than just me hashing out a book and throwing it out like a blog post on Amazon, you know, so for me, it, it forces me to actually make a better book. 
But in order to actually get a book deal with, let's just say, one of the major five publishers, which is like Simon & Schuster, Penguin Random House, those types of publishers, you probably need at least an audience of 10 to 20,000 people. Um, what they're looking for is it's hard for them to invest in a book that they that it doesn't look like it'll sell 10,000 copies. If you can prove to them that you can sell at least 10,000 copies, you can probably get a book deal for like 100 grand. If you if it looks like you can sell 50,000 or more, you'll pro- you can get six figures. You can probably get a good amount of money for a book deal. Wow. Talk to me about the writing process. A lot of people listening to this, myself included, want to write a book. You've, you've done two things I want to talk to you about. You've obviously written your own books, and then you've also co-authored books. Um, let's talk about writing books first. Do you have any unique tips or advice for people who just want to write a book? What do they need to do? Yeah, I think book writing is a huge amount of fun. It, it's so much harder than writing blog posts hmm. um, because you have to like you build... First off, you have to kind of know the core idea. And so I think knowing what the core premise is before you write the book and believing in the premise. Um, one of the things that Ryan Holiday taught me, Ryan Holiday wrote, you know, he's written many books on stoicism. He actually helped me a lot with willpower doesn't work. He helped me write the book proposal. He helped me get the agent and he even man, you know, he helped me throughout the whole writing of that book. Wow. One of the things that he taught me, and that was my first book was, you know, you want to, you really need to know what the idea is in the beginning, why, why, why other people should care about this idea and why you're the person that should write it. That has a lot to do with the positioning. So like with willpower, and, and again, you get to decide those things. It's not like there's a right answer to any of those, but you should know what the idea is, why people should care, and why you're the person to write it. Um, so in the case of willpower doesn't work, the idea was your environment is way more powerful than your willpower. And if you're relying on willpower, you're going to be screwed. There's a huge audience, whether it be self-improvement, addiction circles, or even entrepreneurial circles that I could make the case for why willpower is a bad idea. And then I'm the reason I'm the person to write it. I talk about just my own changes of environment and how shifting my environments made desired change really easy for myself. Um, Hmm. So I I think just knowing the idea, who it's for, why it's so relevant, why it's so important, why people should care. And then honestly, just having your own story of why you're the person that should be writing this book is key. Uh, When it comes to actually just writing it, structuring the book from the beginning is the key to writing blog posts and books, in my opinion. Like whenever it came to writing a blog post, I would always start with what's the main idea here, start with the title. And then what are like, what are all the sub ideas, which would be like, you know, if it was a listicle, like five items, you know, what are the five main ideas here? If you can build the bones and the structure, then you can just write in a free flowing manner without restraint. But if you don't have a structure, then you're not really beginning with the end in mind. You're just kind of wandering and then you're not, you ultimately waste a lot of time going in circles. The structure will change enormously, you know, just as an example with the gap in the game, the book I'm writing right now, and even who not how, the structure changed a thousand times, but you at least need a structure so that you can start to say, what are the main ideas I'm trying to present here? What are the main stories or the main quotes? You just really start getting the building blocks first, and then you can start thinking about how you want to order them and what's the most easy way for the reader to understand what's the easiest flow. Yeah. And let's talk about co-authoring too. Um, I listen to Dan Sullivan a lot, who I know you are obviously very close with and have learned a lot from. So the whole even concept of the book you guys co-wrote together, Who Not How, is that there are who's that can do things that you can't do and and you need them. So for instance, what I believe happened is he didn't know how to publish an author book. He found you, you co-authored a book for him and Shazam, he has a published book. For people... I mean, do you have any advice for people who maybe they have a platform or they have a voice, but they're not going to actually sit down and write something, but maybe, you know, they speak all the time or they have their own podcast and they want to transform that into a book. Can you speak to those leaders listening and what would your advice be to them? Yeah, there's two potential options when it comes to who, not how I was a fan of Dan Sullivan's for years. And then I, you know, got into his environments before I even joined strategic coach and I heard him teach who, not how, and I just thought, you know, as I even talked about in the book, I said, Dan, if you ever want this to be a mainstream book, I'll, I'll write the book for you. Um, and so that's kind of how that one was birthed. And so I was actually the one who initiated that. Um, and he was like, I've been looking for someone like you for 30 years. Um, <laughs> but uh, when it comes to, I, I, so the whole premise of who, not how is that if you demand that you're the one who does everything, then you're screwed because there's a lot of when it comes to any goal, there's a lot of hows involved. There's, it's kind of like you demanding that you're the one who fixes your car rather than gives it to a, like a mechanic. It, rather than you fixing your own car, just give it to a mechanic. Let them fix your car. Um, and so there are plenty of who's out there. There's an enormous amount of people out there. There's infinite amount of people out there who want to do 
the tasks involved in helping you achieve your goals, the thing a leader must do is, is define the vision, clarify what success looks like, and then find the right people to take over the hows and get out of the way. Don't do it. Don't micromanage them. Don't tell them how to do their job. Just let them do it and recognize that they'll do it differently and probably better than you because that's what they want to do. That's their expertise. That's their skills. And so it's, it's a real beautiful model on leadership and motivation. But yeah, as far as for someone out there who, let's just say, wants a book written and they don't see themselves as a writer or they don't want to go through the tedious process of spending thousands of hours writing that book, they would rather continue their podcast or continue running their company, but they do want books written. There's a, a ton of ways to do that. One is, is you could hire a ghost writer, which is one way of doing it so that you're the main author. Or you could, you know, if you do have someone who, like myself, is already an author and already likes what you're talking about, you could create a, a collaboration. Most entrepreneurs would probably be best off. I mean, it's kind of an ideal situation if you can already get an, an author with a huge audience who wants to collaborate with you. But usually someone in that case is, are, is kind of looking for someone who already either has an audience or there's some form of mutual explosion. But there's an enormous amount of very good writers out there who you could hire. I know many entrepreneurs who come out with one, two, three books a year. I mean, even Dan. Dan publishes four little books a year. He writes none of them. He just teaches and he comes up with ideas and he's got a writer who writes the books for him. Dan doesn't even correct any of the books. You know, he applies for not how he doesn't even edit those books anymore. He used to, but now they've gotten in such sync that he doesn't even provide a single correction. He just lets the who do the how, you know, Dan just comes up with new ideas all day and then records himself talking and the person takes the recordings, turns it into a book. And then every quarter, Dan's got a new book. So Amazing. it's just, it's just getting people on your team. If you're willing to invest in people on your team, you can do a lot of things that you could not do if you're demanding that you require, you know, do it all by yourself. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that you, you're transitioning from, you know, writing blog posts or shorter articles to YouTube. Uh, as a writer, I'm just curious why the transition and, and what are you learning about being on video versus just using your, your keyboard? You know, one of the things that I've thought about recently is what were the things that stopped my former self from doing things that I wanted to do? You know, just, a, you know, this is a really random example, but if you think about Bitcoin, just as an example, I know it's such a trendy topic, but people have been aware of that for years. And so what's the difference between being aware of something to knowing that it's useful to actually taking action? So going back to myself and YouTube, I think I was, I was certainly aware of YouTube five years ago when I was crushing it on Medium. And I probably even desired to build a YouTube platform seeing the value of it. But I, I, there, was, there was aspects of the former version of me that was stopped on making that decision. One of them was actually who, not how. I didn't understand who, not how back then. Um, there's so much more complexity to filming videos, having them edited, thrown on YouTube. All of those things were things that I didn't want to do. And so as a result, I didn't do it. Um, whereas now that I'm much more investment oriented, more collaborative oriented, more who not how oriented, I could easily just hire someone who manages my YouTube channel. I just shoot the video, send it to the guy, he edits it. So there was friction to me actually doing it, which led me to procrastinating. Um, but now that I understand example, who not how, and I'm more of an investment oriented person, those restraints are no longer restraints for me. I just shoot a video send it to other people, let them do the rest. As far as to your full question about the writing process, to me, it actually feels the same. The majority of my work is just learning good ideas and then framing them and then writing them. In, the, in this case, rather than just writing in a stream of consciousness way, I just speak them in front of a camera. It's a lot easier, to be honest with you, to do it in front of a camera than write. Uh, mm -hmm. even, even though most of my writing was stream of consciousness where I would just create a structure and then just write in a really intense state. Now it's just create a structure in the journal and just bang, just talk. So it's actually a lot faster and it's a lot easier to do YouTube videos. I can do like five YouTube videos in a day sometimes, whereas in the past it would be like one article a day. Well, I want to start to, the transition into some of the books that you wrote, but uh, any other advice that you would give leaders on building their platform, becoming a published author or a YouTube star? Uh, two things. One is you have to really want to be a teacher, I think, in order to, to, to do that. Like it, if you love teaching, if you love the ideas you're learning, you know, for me, I'm not ever going to get sick of what I'm learning. To me, it's an endless well, an endless wormhole. And so I think if you love what you're teaching, if you want to share it with other people, you just choose the medium, whether it's writing, whether it's video, whether it's audio, 
you can choose whatever medium is most comfortable to you. And then I would say commit to either a year or to a number when it comes to like this year for me, for example, with my YouTube channel, uh, right now there's like 83 videos on the YouTube channel. I've been doing it for six months. I, but I do have the goal of having 400 videos on the channel before the end of this year, wow. which is, I've done all the math. It's like, it's going to, it's, I've got to do like 35 a, a month, you know, between now and the end of the year. So you have ends goals and process goals. My process goal is I'm going to do 400 videos before the end of this year. The ends goal, 250,000 or more subscribers, hopefully more on the you know high side. But I think you kind of have to have a why for doing it, obviously. For me, the why is really obvious, really good income when it comes to YouTube, builds my platform, which helps my books be successful, gives me something to do. <laughs> Honestly, I just <laughs> like teaching. If you're already too busy for those things, hire someone, you know, hire someone good to write your content or film your videos. If you want to be the face, go ahead and film your videos or write your books. But I would just say apply who, not how as much as you can. It makes it so much easier. So if you're not a writer, hire a writer. Uh, if you're not the video editor, hire a video editor, get yourself out of the way as much as you can. And you just do the part you want. If it's coming up with the idea, recording it and giving it to someone, do that part. If it's filming the video, but then giving it to the editor and getting out of the way, you do your part and then get out of your way as fast as possible so that it doesn't get stopped at you. Most people, it just gets stopped at them, whatever that means. And if you can get just your part right and then build a team around it, then it can move forward and you can build a system around it rather than it's still not happening. And it's been two or three years and you don't have that book or you don't have that blog or you don't have that video. Like find what you want and then give, get who's for the rest. It's so good. Now we've been talking about Dan Sullivan and who, not how, and, and all these concepts for a while. Uh, I guess before we talk about the books, I do think it'd be good to give people context. Um, can you talk a little bit about strategic coach, which is Dan's organization. And even I, I threw out their genius network, which I know you're a part of, What's your experience been like with those two organizations and what have you learned from, uh, what would your advice be for leaders listening to this when it comes to networking or putting yourself in environments that really help you grow and excel? There's infinite environments out there. Uh, there's so many different, you know, if you're wanting to get into crypto as an example, there's a lot of crypto environments. If you're wanting to like learn online marketing, there's online. I think that it's really good to put yourself in environments with experts, uh, environments with people who are two, three, four, and 10 steps ahead of you. And so when it came to me, uh, this was back in 2017, when I had first gotten my book deal for willpower doesn't work. Uh, I was not, you know, I didn't have very much money back then. That was the first time I had like gotten a chunk of money, which was for that book. And I immediately invested 25,000 of it to go into genius network, because I knew that a lot of very successful authors had been through that group. And a lot of my favorite authors had been. So I joined that group because I want to learn from a lot of the authors, specifically in my case, so that I could launch what, what became Willpower Doesn't Work in an effective way. Um, and so that was my initial motivation for joining those groups. But one of the things that I learned, and I'm grateful for that, is I learned how to take my audience and very much monetize it and turn it into a very successful business. Because in the case of Genius Network, it's a very entrepreneurial and a very marketing-based uh, mastermind, I guess you could call it. And so... There's a lot of unexpected byproducts when you join groups like that. Um, just as an example, I, I met my, my financial advisor in Strategic Coach. That person has changed my financial life and my financial future. That wasn't my necessary plan when I joined Strategic Coach. I just wanted to, I joined Strategic Coach myself because I was already collaborating with Dan. But when it comes to just an entrepreneur joining one of these groups, I think you should have a goal initially, but be open to the transformational effect of the environments. There's a lot of people in there. Uh, there's a lot of situations and opportunities that you're not expecting, which can take you to some good places, but you also have to be aware because a lot of people in those groups are looking for either partners or deals or th stuff like that. So you kind of have to be clear on where you want to go while still open to the right potential collaborations. Uh, I will say I've probably met four or five people over four, like over four years in those groups that have made the big difference. Otherwise, a lot of it's just a distraction. Good people, great friends I've met. But there's like four people that I met that's like, okay, these people changed my trajectory. So what I heard you just say, and again, if you didn't catch that, you invested $25,000 just to be a part of this network. A lot of leaders would just say, what? You spent how much? But the ROI has been the relationships that you built and the ROI has been exponential, it sounds like. Can you talk about investing your own money? Because again, people may say, and that was one of the first things you did, which I love. Hey, hey I got this sum of money and the first thing I did was, was spend 25000 on this networking group. Why was that so important to you? I believe in exponential relationships. I believe that relationships can be exponential. They can be wormholes. They can be, they can be things that create 
you know, they can skip you lots of steps. And so I know I don't know everything. And so I just wanted to put myself in the right environment where I could get mentoring, but also the right collaborations and stuff like that. So I, I do believe that relationships are fundamental. And I still believe that. I know that whoever I'm partnering, it's very much a who, not how philosophy. I know that the who's that I'm in connection with in large part determine my trajectory. It's the whole idea your net worth is based on your network. So I, I already believed in those ideas. And really the, the reason I joined Genius Network is because my aunt was already in Genius Network. She joined Genius Network back in 2014 and I watched her consciousness as a person, kind of like her awareness and her just mindset really go through an upgrade. And then I watched the kind of, it's kind of like a, a iceberg, you know, you got the subconscious down below and then up above, you've got the results. Usually there's a huge subconscious shift that happens before it occurs at the conscious level. And I watched that happen. I watched her totally go through a transformational experience, kind of first off investing in herself. I think there's a lot of, a lot good to say. I think investing in yourself is really important, whether that's investing in education, investing in mentorships, even investing in who's me hiring my YouTube editor is an investment in myself. Um, so those kind of things upgrade your confidence. They upgrade your commitment to your goals and they expand your views of what's possible. So I watched her go through that. And then I watched the, the trickle effect of how over time her business really started to explode. And so I watched her do that in 2014 when I first went to Clemson. And then three years later, I'm now this top writer on medium. I now have a book deal. And so it just made sense to me. And it wasn't scary for me to invest $25,000 to go through a transformational experience, which I thought it's not going to be hard to get this money back. Like when you're, when you're, a, and this is one of the things we actually talk about in who, not how, if you're a cost minded human, then you think it costs $25,000. I've got to be, I've got to find a way to get that $25,000 back. Whereas if you're an investment minded human, you think, okay, this is an investment in my future self. It's going to be easy in this situation to find an opportunity to take that 25,000 and make it at least 250,000 or a million. Like you don't, you stop thinking about the 25,000 and you start, you stop thinking about how can I get this back, which is really a scarcity mindset. And you just start thinking, okay, now that I'm in this environment and now I'm going to just grow what's possible. It's really easy to get $25,000 back in those types of situations, but you don't even think about that. You're more thinking about, you know, where do I want to go? So good. Uh, I want to talk about a book you wrote called personality is not permanent. I love this because I do love personality tests, but nice. uh, we use one in our organization called the predictive index, which it w I really, really enjoy. But it is funny. I've had so many team members that you either love personality tests or you hate them. And, and the people that hate them, they would always say, I, you can't put me in a box. You cannot put me in a box. And so you actually wrote a book about this whole concept. And can you just talk about why you wrote this book and what you want leaders to get out of it? Personality isn't permanent. Although personality tests are something I, I hit in the book, it's certainly not the main concept. But the main point of the book is that it's really easy for people to get stuck in patterns, which yeah. is why people can be predictive, as that test would you know, argue. But the reason they're predictive is not because they're fixed. You know, personality is not a fixed trait. Um, usually it's the byproduct of other things. You know, and I break down those things, which is you know, your identity story, your environment, unresolved trauma. So really what uh, my goal of that book was to show is why people actually get stuck in patterns, why they stay stuck as their former self rather than choosing a desired future self. And basically what I do in the book is just show that personality is not a fixed trait at all. Uh, there's plenty of research to show that personality is very surface level. Identity is much deeper and your identity is your story, your narrative about yourself. And really it's, it's up to all of us to decide what our story is, our narrative is, and from my standpoint, it should be based on your desired future self, um, the person you want to be in the future. And so the book is an invitation for people to stop being so attached to their past, to yeah. start designing their future self, and then to use the present to create the future that they want. And to base your identity and even your personality on your goals, rather than what most people do. And most people, they base their goals on their current personality. So they're saying, this is who I am. So I'm going to set goals that fit with who I am. I think that that's a really non-conscious way of living. I think rather than saying, this is my personality, so I'm going to set goals to fit my box. It's what are the goals you want? And then to design your personality based on your desired goals. And very doable. I've watched myself transform many times, even to become an entrepreneur, to learn a principle like who, not how, to go from someone who would not have invested in things like you know, employees and things like that to having that be my identity. I mean, we all need to shift our identity. You know, if you want to go from being a non-fit person to a fit person, a non-runner to a runner, 
you know, a non-religious person to a religious person, a religious person to a non-religious person. It's all a shift in identity. And if you can understand that identity is the driver and that you actually are the one who's setting your identity and your identity is the thing guiding your behavior, then you can, you can just, you can start controlling the ship of your life. Yeah. And, and one thing I loved about you researching you is part of your identity is your dad. And uh, you've actually adopted three, three children that you fostered. And you mentioned earlier, you, then you had three kids, so yeah. six kids, which is crazy. But can you talk a little bit about fostering? I just want to hear why that's important to you and why, why should people care about fostering kids? Yeah, it's awesome. It was not my original goal. My dad was actually adopted. Um, he was never fostered, but it was not my goal to be a foster parent. It was actually my wife's goal. She grew up with foster kids in her house, older ones, teenagers. I think she had like 50 teenage girls wow. short term. They were short term. You know, they'd be in for like a month and out. And so over years, she had like 50 girls in and out of her house growing up. And that just kind of had an impression on her. And so foster care was something that she was always interested in. And so when we moved out to Clemson, she just said, you know, what are your thoughts? We've been married for like two or three years. Do you want to get into foster care? And I, I was totally comfortable with that. I was flexible with that. And so... Yeah, we got into it. It was a huge transition for me, a huge transition for me and my wife. We actually initially got two of these siblings, their siblings. We got the three-year-old and the five-year-old. And then a couple months later, we actually learned that they had a seven-year-old brother, full-on, full sibling who was in a group home. And so when we learned about him, we're like, well, we'd like the siblings together, so we'll take him. And uh, it took three years. You know, It took over three years to eventually adopt those kids. Um, we had to fight the foster system in court uh, we really want to do it. There was no real good alternative situation for them among their family. And so, yeah, I would say it was a very worthwhile experience. Obviously now we've adopted, adopted those kids and I'm now just, I love these kids. They're now 13, nine and 11 or 13, yeah, 13, 11 and nine. Um, oldest kid, Caleb, he's just way into tennis, plays tennis like five times a week. Jordan, 11 year old girl, she's into gymnastics, all sorts of stuff. Logan, freaking cool kid, plays tennis, loves RC cars. Like to me, it, it really changed my life. I'm still just learning how to make it a priority. You know, like it's, it's, it's a transition. It's, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't really know what else to say except just that it did change my life. I actually don't think it took anything away from my success. I think it actually uh, lit a really cool fire within me. One of, one of, the, one of the principles of, of willpower doesn't work is that, and this is a principle in psychology. I mean, even there's a concept in psychology called the Pygmalion effect. Basically what the Pygmalion effect says is that your performance is based on the demands of your situation. And there's a quote from Will Durant, who's a famous historian. He said, the ability of the average person could be doubled if the situation demanded it. Usually people are not performing highly because there's no reason to, um, there's no urgency to. And so when I was a first year PhD student and now we go from having zero kids to now having these two kids, all of a sudden I felt this insane added pressure to grow my career, to succeed as an author so that I could provide for this new family that I got. And so I felt like it was a real ex exponential boost to my motivation to succeed, to support this new family that all of a sudden was obviously hoisted upon us. We chose it ourselves, but it was awesome. It continues to change me every day. Wow. Well, thank you for doing that. I, those kids' lives will never be the same. And uh, it's inspiring for me and my wife as well. And I'm sure will. Um, so thank you for doing that. Um, I want to transition now into the, what I call the lightning round. Just a bunch of fun questions that I love to ask leaders in every interview. And the first one is, what is the best advice you've ever received and who gave it to you? <laughs> oh my goodness. It's so hard for me to answer that question. <laughs> just cause I'm always like learning so many ideas that like I, it's always like the last thing I learned. The thing that sticks out right now and it's, it doesn't answer your question as far as what's the best advice I've ever gotten. But the, the advice that I've recently applied, which really helps is to live your principles. Um, recently there was a situation that could have ended a really cool situation I'm a part of. And basically I had to decide, do I want to flush this, cool situation down the toilet or do I want to keep it? But if I keep it, it's going to really compromise what I believe in. It's going to compromise what I value. And I just decided in a really sincere way to say, I don't need this. I think you should always operate on want, not need. If you feel like you need something, hmm. then you're going to get desperate for it. You're overly dependent on it. You're not healthy. You're going to, you're going to be reactive. You're going to make stupid decisions. So if you can take ownership and say, I want this, but I don't need it. And that's what I did. I said, I really want this opportunity. I love this, but there's a line that I'm going to draw 
And if you guys are inviting me to cross that line and go against the premise of what I thought that this relationship was based on, I'm out. I don't need to be in this relationship. I don't need you guys. I want to be in this relationship. I think this is a mutually awesome opportunity, but I don't need it. I can go and do what I want. And I think that by owning my own self-trust, by owning my own principles, I actually gained an enormous trust and amount of respect from them. And they all, and they also realized, oh crap, if Ben's gone, we lose out on a lot. And so Dan Sullivan would call that always be the buyer. Uh, always be the buyer, meaning you're the one who determines the relationships you go in. And it has to, it's not always on your terms. I mean, it should be collaborative and, and transformational, but you're the one who decides yes or no, if this resonates or not. And I think taking that ownership in your relationships and being clear about where you stand helps you to avoid a lot of crappy situations. If you could put a quote on a billboard for everyone to read, what would it say? I really like the quote, and this is probably my favorite quote from Robert Brault. So I just stick the quote on there. We're kept from our goals, not by obstacles, but by a clear path to a lesser goal. I know that that's a little, a little complicated, but I'll say it again. We're kept from our goal, not by obstacles, but by a clear path to a lesser goal. Um, usually it's, it's not the obstacles between you and your goals that stops you. It's actually that you've got lesser goals that you're entertaining, lesser potentials, lesser realities. You know, it's tough. It's like, you know, if you're still saying yes to lesser goals, whether that be lesser opportunities, lesser relationships, then you're not pursuing what you really want. And so I think that that's the main reason that people get screwed is they say yes to lesser goals. Wow. That's so good. What's the best purchase you've made in the last year for a hundred dollars or less? Mm. I have been, I've got on order these protein bars that I've got, which are like the best protein bars. And so I get 30 of them a, a month. They're, and, and they're just really high quality protein bars. Keep me full G2G G2G protein bars. Really good. What are the top two or three books that have made an impact on your life? Either recently or all time. Yeah. Huge fan of this book. This is not my favorite book, but this has made an impact. The war of art. Gosh, it's funny that I don't have answers to these questions. It's because I've literally read like 20 books in the last month trying to write <laughs> this book that like my mind is muddled. I'll just say The Power of Starting Something Stupid by Richie Norton. Hmm. That book is the book that pushed me to finally start writing. Wow. I've never heard of it. I'll have to check it yeah, out. Yeah, The Power of Starting Something Stupid by Richie Norton. I read it twice in a row back in 2014. And then I'm like, okay. And I went and finally wrote, wrote my book. Wow. My first book, Slipstream Time Hacking. What's something um, that people may not know about your journey that you wish they knew? I don't know. I don't really need people to know my journey. You know, I mean, I like, I, it's an on, unfolding journey and I'm happy to continue sharing what I learn along the way. I don't think there's really anything that there's really nothing at this point, you know, maybe in a future book, they'll learn about it, but there's nothing that I haven't said already that I need people to know about me. You get to spend time with a lot of quality people. I'm just curious, do you have a, a question that you always ask when you get a meeting with a, a high quality person like a Dan Sullivan or someone like that? No, I just always, add, you know, I believe that there's a difference between information gathering and applied knowledge. And mm -hmm. so I'm always asking the question that I'm trying to solve right now. So like, you know, if I'm trying to solve a specific question, I'm trying to learn about taxes, or I'm trying to learn about how to structure this book, or I'm, it, I'm always asking questions related to the problem I'm currently trying to solve. And so there's not just a one size fits all question that I ever ask. Whenever I have something I'm trying to solve or something I want to know more about, I just drill into that and I ask the smartest people I already know about it. And then I try to find the right sources of information on that particular subject. And so I do ask questions all the time, got saved even yesterday, asking some very smart people questions that helped me out of a pickle, but there's not a one size fits all question I've got. What's something you've done that you think everyone should do? I think having kids, I think having kids, if it's possible, it may not be possible in all cases. Uh, sometimes you have to adopt maybe, but I do think that if possible, that's a really life-changing experience. You know, I could do the cliche things like run a marathon, write a book, go skydiving, done all those things. But having kids is something that I think is really powerful and transformational. Is there something left on your bucket list that you'd like to do? I have tons of things on my bucket list. Um, I am always growing my bucket list. 
want to have a YouTube channel with millions of subscribers. We're going to be going next year with my kids to Europe. You know, we're going to be in Europe for like six weeks, just kind of Airbnb being, uh, nice. in different now, you know, hopefully COVID's free by then, but, uh, yeah, I want to get back out and serve more church missions for my church. I, I'd like to write a huge amount of books. I mean, I have all these <laughs> these pictures on my wall. One yeah. of them says write 50 books. So I, I just want to write a lot of books. I'm going to I'm actually training for an ultra marathon right now. A hundred nice. miles. Yeah, a hundred mile ultra marathon. I'm gonna do that next January. Are so you doing just, bad water or no, I'm doing one in Phoenix. You know, it's okay. probably just some basic one. Um, not one of those intense 135. And, you know, it's just basic, like an a basic ultra marathon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, basic ultra marathon. I've got, I hired a, applied, who not how, hired a running coach who, wow. you know, it's not that expensive. It was like a thousand bucks for a year of coaching. He sends me my weekly plan. Uh, it's really good to outsource your training to an expert. And so yes. really easy, get a who, it gets you more inve uh, invested, it gets you more committed and it lays out a plan from their perspective, not your perspective. And you can obviously adapt it at your own level, but yeah, uh, if you ask me in a year from now, my bucket list would be different. Well, now you have me intrigued. So for podcast listeners, they may not be able to see this, but behind you, there's a ton of pictures. Are you telling mm -hmm. me that each one of those is a goal? If so, I'm gonna be extremely jealous. <laughs> No, most okay. of them are well, most of them are concepts. Most of them are uh, just. This is called a culture wall from gaping void. Uh, it's essentially my belief system turned into pictures. What? So like, um, yeah, it's it's to design an environment and to create a culture. There's a lot of companies that use this, but yeah, I mean, it's got things like expect everything attached to nothing. You know, write it down, make it happen. Design beats willpower. I mean, this is basically my belief system turned into pictures. And there's a company is, that did this for you. Yeah, Gaping Void. They're a culture design company. They uh, they create, they help design culture. Culture is designable, and when you design culture, you design behavior. And so, the smartest thing to do is design an environment that guides the behavior in the direction you want it to go. Unbelievable! I'm so inspired. Uh, if you could go back and have coffee with your 20 year old self, what would you tell him? Uh, I love having conversations with my former self in my journal all the time. There's a really good quote from Will Faulkner. He said that the past is not dead. It's not even past. And so the truth is, is your former self is still <laughs> existing in your head. I would probably tell my former self, knowing what I know now, to begin investing in Bitcoin. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, I would tell, you know, on a more principle-based level, <laughs> seriously, start investing money. Like even if it's like $100 dollars a week or a month, like the faster you can start investing money, the more you start, you know, you, you train your mindset on what to think about in psychology, we call it selective attention. And so if you start behaving in certain ways, you start paying attention to how to do that well. And so yes, start investing money. I wish I would have done that sooner. Or I don't really wish I'd done it sooner. But had I done that, I'd be in a different situation. I would have told my 20 year old self to start writing books sooner. Mm -hmm. Don't wait those four years. Um, just start at uh, probably just those two things, you know, invest money and start, start working towards your goals faster. Don't, you don't need to know everything. If I would have started sooner, I'm not, I don't have any regrets towards my former self. I think it's important to have compassion towards your former self. They were far more ignorant than you are right now. And so there's no reason to judge them based on your current self standards and knowledge. But if I would have started sooner on investing money and in pursuing my goals, rather than feeling like I needed more information or knowledge, I would absolutely be much farther ahead than I am right now. And at the end of your life, what do you want to be remembered for? You know, realistically, just my family. You know, I'm not, I don't need to have some huge legacy. I don't need to be this. I just mo mostly just care about my family. And so that's pretty much it. Just that I was a good person, lived what I believed, was a good dad. Yeah, I don't need to have any amazing, you know, people outside of that know anything about me. Anything else you want to leave leaders with today? Yeah, I would just say start investing in who's. I mean, I think it's it's uh, it's it's the thing to do. It can be scary. Like if you're a leader and you don't have a uh, an assistant that manages your schedule and your email, and that, you know, like start there. You know, like outsource all of the tasks you're doing, which creates a lot of decision fatigue and turns your brain a million different directions and removes flow. If you want to be in flow and if you want to perform at your highest level and if you want to get rest and recovery do way less, just do the few things that you really love doing and slowly start building who's into your life and start investing in who's. And then eventually when you actually start learning that principle at a high level, then your goals start to become 
almost anything becomes available because you realize that there's a who right there who can just immediately connect the dot, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's like, if you want to get really into real estate investing, well, who can you learn from? Who can you collaborate from? Like there's, once you start applying who, not how, you don't have to go through the process of grinding your way up there. You just immediately get the who connect the dot. And then it just, it just fast tracks you wherever you want to go. So, uh, I think read who, not how <laughs> it's yeah. a really easy book for entrepreneurs, for leaders. And it teaches you, I believe the real way to be a leader, which is to provide the vision, which is the what and the why what you want to accomplish, why it's so important. And then it allows you to communicate that to the right who, and then it allows you to step back, not be involved, not micromanage, trust them, give them ownership, which increases their motivation and watch as you're able to produce way more results and way better results and way faster results than if you were the one trying to do all these things by yourself, or if you were micromanaging the process. Well, Benjamin, this has been a phenomenal conversation. Thank you for every minute of it. We'll include links to all of your books, your YouTube channel and everything else in the show notes. So make sure you subscribe and, and go buy all of his books. But thank you for your time today. This was wonderful. Doug, Will, my pleasure. Happy to be with you. Yeah, if you're ever back in Pittsburgh, let's, uh, let's connect. Yins be some good Pittsburghers, right? <laughs> That's right. Well, hey, Leader, thank you so much for listening to my conversation with Benjamin Hardy. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. You can find ways to connect with him and links to everything that we discussed in the show notes at l3leadership.org forward slash 281. As always, if this episode helped you, it would mean the world to me if you would share your takeaways on social media or share this with three to five other leaders that you think it could add value to. Again, that helps us reach more leaders, which is our mission here at L3 Leadership. And as always, leaders, I really want to challenge you that if you want to 10x your growth this year, I want to challenge you to either launch or join an L3 Leadership Mastermind Group. Mastermind groups have been the greatest source of growth in my life over the past six years. If you're unfamiliar with what they are, they're groups of six to 12 leaders that meet together for at least one year in order to help each other grow, achieve their goals, and to do life together. So if you're interested in learning more, go to l3leadership.org forward slash masterminds. And as always, I like to end every episode with a quote, and I'll quote John Maxwell today. I love this quote that I read the other day. He said this, he said, if I know who I am, it gives me identity. If I accept who I am, it gives me security. If I enjoy who I am, it gives me fulfillment. If I improve who I am, it gives me growth. And if I share who I am, it gives me multiplication. I just love that. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Laura and I love you so much. We believe in you. Keep leading. Keep making a difference. Don't give up. And we'll talk to you next episode.